Hello, my name is Letizia Trevis, and I'm the curator of the later Italian and Spanish pictures here at the National Gallery. And by popular demand, today I'm going to talk to you about Caravaggio. And Caravaggio is an artist who's uh, as well known for his art as he is for his bad behavior. Uh, and the purpose of today's talk is really to talk you through his life. So it is um, you know, a lot about the biography of the artist, but I'm going to use the pictures that we have here to illustrate um, why he was so uh, famous then and so innovative in his style. And um, the National Gallery is extremely lucky to have three major works by Caravaggio, one from each of the distinct phases of his career. So it's the sort of perfect place to give you uh, this talk, if you like. So Caravaggio was born in Milan in 1571, um, but his name is Michelangelo Merisi, uh, but he's known as Caravaggio after the small town to the east of Milan from which his parents came and where he spent quite a few years during his childhood as well. Uh, his father was a mason, a muratore, and uh, he died when Caravaggio was just six years old. Uh, and there's been speculation as to whether Caravaggio was sort of launched in that career before he became a painter, but there's really no evidence for that. Um, what we do know is that when he was 13, he was sent to Milan, and he signed a four-year apprenticeship with an artist called Simone Peterzano, an artist from Bergamo, who'd worked in Venice and who sort of styled himself as Titian's pupil. And he works with him for four years, and we have a contract, but we don't have much else. But one can imagine that in the workshop, he learned the rudiments of drawing, he learned um, how to grind colors, how to prepare canvases, um, he may have learned how to um, paint in fresco, although he, he is not a fresco painter later on in his career. Um, and after these four years with Peterzano, there's a sort of mystery. We don't really know what happened to him until 1592, and that is when he goes to Rome, almost certainly in 1592, around the age of 20. And this is the problem with Caravaggio. There's very little documentary evidence, and of course it's been scrutinized and read in many, many different ways. Um, and it's very fragmentary, and so we've tried to reconstruct his life on the basis of the documents, uh, but really we rely enormously on the biographers who wrote about him, which of course uh, do provide conflicting information sometimes, uh, and often have their own slant on, on Caravaggio, so even that has to be sort of taken with a pinch of salt. But um, Caravaggio arrives in Rome, he's about 20, and of course now we know he, he became a very famous artist, but when he arrived, he was a nobody. Um, he arrived and he really was desperate, destitute. He jumped from one wor workshop to another. He painted hack work. We know he produced these sort of heads, you know, three heads a day for no money. He lived with someone called Pandolfo Pucci, who he nicknamed Monsignor Insalata, Mr. Salad, because apparently that's all he ate under his roof. He was given very meager uh, food. Um, but the biographers do agree on certain points of these early years. It seems that he arrived and somehow um, worked in the workshop of a Sicilian painter called Lorenzo Carli. We know nothing about him, really. Um, and no paintings can be attributed to him from this time. And then he worked in two other workshops, Antiveduto Grammatica and Cavalier d'Arpino. And what we know about these two experiences were, is that for Antiveduto, he painted heads. And for Arpino, he painted flowers and fruit. And this is important because these two formative experiences really help in understanding the early group of works that Caravaggio produced. And we know from the biographers that having sort of jumped from one workshop to another, he then decided to launch himself as an independent artist, but really struggled. I mean, he, he was, as I said, destitute. Um, he was painting pictures for the open market. I mean, artists at this time either worked within a workshop framework, um, or they were patronized by a wealthy patron who would sometimes house them in their palazzo uh, and would protect them as well. And of course, Caravaggio had neither of those th two things at this point in his career. So he produces works for the open market and manages to catch the eye of uh, influential patrons that way. Um, and we know that one of these pictures that he produced was the boy bitten by a lizard, which we have here in the National Gallery. There's another version of this picture in the Fondazione Longhi, which is generally attributed to Caravaggio, but is not unanimously accepted. And as you can see, remember what I said before about his formative years. So here there's the combination of a beautiful still life uh, with these sort of half-length figures. And you can see how those formative experiences might have led to this kind of picture. But this is a very original and novel kind of picture for its subject matter. And that's almost certainly what attracted the attention of these patrons in Rome. 
It's a sort of genre subject that, of course, one might have seen in northern Italy and even in northern Europe, but really was very new to Rome. And this picture has been read in many different ways. It's been read in sort of a, a kind of poetic vein, looking at literature and poetry of the time. It's been read as an allegory, an allegory of um, the sense of touch. It's also been read as an allegory of the, the, the sort of pains that hide behind beauty, the pains of love, the lizard hidden amongst the sensuous fruit, you know. But actually, I think the most convincing reading is perhaps the most straightforward, which is just really, it's a, it's a study in expression. This boy of sort of, you know, this kind of moment of surprise, of unexpected pain, um, and he's sort of shrinking away. But it's a fascinating picture. I mean, before he was bitten by the lizard, what was this boy actually doing? You know, he has this flower behind his ear. Um, there's something, you know, it's been read in a sort of homoerotic vein as well. And there is something very sensual and sensuous about this picture. And of this early group of paintings of youths and boys, which I should say are often based um, on, on clearly on live models and on people that Caravaggio knew. Sometimes they also include his own portrait. We know he used his own image because he couldn't afford models. He couldn't afford to pay models. And this picture has also been read as a self-portrait, although generally that's now discounting. I personally don't think it is a self-portrait. I mean, I'm sure you know this picture, and if not, after the talk, do come and look at it more closely. The really striking element of these early works is the quality of the still life. I mean, this fruit, you can just pick these cherries up, you know, it's, it's good enough to eat. Um, and the combination of that with these sort of sensual youths, quite androgynous looking and, and, and rather ambiguous to read, it's, it's an odd subject. And you can imagine it would have spurred interesting and lively conversations if it was hanging on, um, you know, a cardinal's wall or on a sort of in elite circles. And as well as this sort of picture of a youth, there's a famous picture in the Borghese of a boy holding a basket of fruit as well, where once again, still life plays a very important role in these early pictures. Um, he also painted sort of street scenes and, um, you know, famously the card shops, you know, card players cheating, hiding cards behind, another man behind signaling, um, or fortune tellers. And these were um, highly theatrical scenes, but things that one would have seen in everyday life uh, in the streets of Rome at the time, but incredibly novel to sort of elevate these genres in a way to sort of history painting. Um, you know, still life was really the lowest form of painting in around 1600. Um, but yet, Caravaggio really managed to elevate that. He famously said that painting still lives required as much artistry as painting the figure, um, which, you know, to us today doesn't seem such a sort of dramatic thing to say, but at the time, you know, it was really uh, quite a novel approach. Um, but what he means is, you know, the importance of nature, of looking around. And so this was his real innovation. It was looking at nature and painting still life, but also using live models. Um, and he was also criticized for this later on in his career, you know, for the fact that he didn't select the best in nature. He just painted exactly what was in front of him. But it was really the sort of most original aspect uh, of his art. So these early pictures brought Caravaggio to the attention of powerful and influential patrons in Rome, uh, principally the Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte, who then uh, invites Caravaggio to live with him in his palazzo, so he now is looked after, protected, um, for about five years. Um, and also the Marchese Vincenzo Giustiniani, another key figure in Rome at the time. And they start, you know, buying pictures by him, they start commissioning pictures um, from him. And, you know, he's certainly far more comfortable within quite a short space of time. But the real breakthrough for his career um, comes in 1599. He receives the commission to paint the pictures today in the Contarelli Chapel in San Luigi dei Francesi. And you have to remember these genre paintings were for a private uh, patron and also for a private environment. They were hanging in these palazzi and they were really accessible to only a few people and, and an elite if you like. But suddenly this is his first public commission and it's the first time that his art can be seen you know, in the public domain, if you like, is accessible to artists and people visiting Rome. And when these pictures were unveiled, and you can still see them today in the Contarelli Chapel, the, the calling of St. Matthew and the martyrdom of St. Matthew, when they were unveiled, I mean, it caused a real sensation. And we know from the biographers, people flocked to Rome to see these pictures. And of course, it was part of an artist's training. You would go to Rome and you look at classical antiquity and you'd also look at contemporary art being produced. And so artists from all over Europe were coming to Rome. And so very quickly, Caravaggio's fame and reputation really went far beyond the confines of Rome itself with these public paintings. 
And shortly after the Contarelli Chapel, he was commissioned to paint pictures in Santa Maria del Popolo, in the Cerasi Chapel. Again, these are private commissions, these are private patrons. It's not the church itself commissioning him, but these pictures were finally on view in public. And that's why, in a way, there's a kind of delayed public reaction to Caravaggio's art. You know, he'd been in Rome for a number of years, but 1600 is a key moment. And the result of that is that um, he's hugely sought after. Uh, and as well as Del Monte and Giustiniani, who I've referred to, uh, there are three brothers, the Mattei, who are very wealthy bankers in Rome, and they commission Caravaggio three paintings in the course of two years, uh, and we know that because we have documents, uh, and he goes to live in, in one of the brothers' palazzi, and one of those pictures is the Supper at Emmaus um, that we have here in the National Gallery. This, is, this was painted in 1601, and for me it sort of shows the real, it's, he's really at the height of his career. He's riding on a wave, you know, on the crest of the wave. Um, he's incredibly famous at this point. Um, and he's already developed as an artist. I mean, you can see just by comparing the two pictures either side of me, um, the sort of awkwardnesses, particularly in the anatomy of this uh, boy, you know, and the way the shoulder doesn't quite work. You can see there's a sophistication already um, in the Supper at Emmaus. The other extraordinary thing about his art, not just using of live models, is of course his use of light, which is what he's now also most famous for. But what was extraordinary about his use of light is it's, it's using the light in a way, not just for sort of uh, the kind of aesthetic enhancement of the picture, but the light always really underpins the meaning in his pictures. So here we have the risen Christ. Instead of showing him on the road to Emmaus, where he meets two disciples who don't immediately recognize him, they invite him to supper, and here they are at supper. And this is the moment that Christ blesses the bread, and the disciples realize that they're sitting with the risen Christ. And he's chosen the culminating moment in the narrative. And this is what Caravaggio is so, so brilliant at doing. It's a familiar subject, but he represents it in a completely novel way, and uh, with a sort of freshness of vision as well. And as I say, he chooses the culminating moment in the narrative, and the light is essential in conveying the story here, because it's the light of recognition. This is the moment the disciples have recognized him. They're leaping up. This one's leaping up out of his chair, his elbows jutting out. The other one is sort of spread his arms in surprise. And the innkeeper, completely oblivious to what's happening, remains in the dark. You know, his face is in shadow because, you know, he hasn't seen the light, if you like. And th this wonderful light not only um, under, underlines the message behind the picture, if you like, and really enhances uh, the message within, um, it's, of course, very theatrical, very dramatic, um, and the way he crops the composition is very theatrical. You know, this sort of half, three-quarter length cropping brings you right into the picture space. You know, you are no longer just a sort of passive viewer. You are taking part. You're a participant in this picture. Not just because their elbows are jutting out into your space or their arms are being thrust out into your space, but of course this brilliant device of the basket of fruit. You know, you're so tempted to just push it back. You know, it's so precariously balanced on the edge of this, this table. Uh, and it's even more vivid because actually this picture is so carefully worked out. When we did x-rays and infrareds, there are, there are almost no changes in this picture except for one. And that is that the apostle on the right, originally his knee was in front of the tablecloth. And what he did was he changed it and put it behind the white cloth. And of course, it's obvious why he did that. It's to emphasize the projection of his arm and of course, the projection of the basket because it makes it so much more vivid, this basket sort of falling into our space. Um, the still life here is, again, I mean, it's sublime. It, it's developed beyond the still life in the boy bitten by the lizard. Um, and, you know, once again, this fruit is, you know, good enough to eat. You know, you can smell it and you can touch it almost. Um, the picture was clearly greatly admired. It sort of encapsulates everything that people admired in Caravaggio. But it was also criticized. One of the biographers, Bellori, in 1672, criticized it for showing Christ unbearded. Um, I mean, he is shown youthful and unbearded, which is certainly unusual and a little unorthodox. I mean, Michelangelo did that in the Sistine Chapel in The Last Judgment. So Caravaggio wasn't the first. In fact, he may well have been trying to reference that in a sort of subliminal way. Um, but it was also criticized for, uh, for the fruit, saying this fruit couldn't possibly be uh, in season at the same time and at Easter tide, you know, when this episode took place. And I find that amusing because it's almost Bellori's irritation that, you know, it's so convincing. And, and you know, Caravaggio's really tricking us into believing this fruit exists in this basket. And he sort of says, well, of course it couldn't exist all at once in one basket at this time of year. Um, but in a way, that encapsulates also how polemical um, Caravaggio was. 
Um, his whole approach to art was very different from other artists. Um, he may have received sort of traditional training in the workshop of Peterzano, but his approach was very much um, no drawing. There are no drawings that exist. Although one has to assume with a composition like this, there must have been preparatory drawings that now no longer exist. And he very much painted directly, you know, in front of the models, positioning them, using these strong light sources. Um, and this was an incredibly novel way of painting, very unlike normal studio practice at the time. And this picture also um, sort of exemplifies these kind of religious history paintings that Caravaggio became uh, so famous in doing, but also so, so, so good at, um, which were essentially for a private clientele, um, predominantly of religious subjects, uh, religious subject matter, intended for Palazzi, um, but sort of painting these religious pictures almost like history paintings. There's a real timeless quality about these pictures, I think, and that's largely also to do with, I think, the light, this use of light, um, because the still life brings this picture into our own reality, if you like. Um, it's so realistic. If we feel that it's in our time, and yet the sort of light and sort of encompassing the picture does kind of give it this very timeless, eternal quality. Um, so 1601, this is really, as I said, he's riding the crest of the wave. This is really the moment for Caravaggio in Rome. And the commissions just keep coming, mainly from private um, collectors, from private patrons, um, some for altarpieces, for their own chapels within churches, um, but a great deal of these sorts of um, religious history pictures. Um, but this is also when fame slightly gets to his head. And, um, and he really does get into quite a lot of trouble from about 1602 to 1606. We can tell from the police records. Um, you know, he's constantly called in, you know, carrying a sword without a license. You were not allowed to walk around Rome with a sword. And, you know, if you were under the patronage of someone like the Cardinal Del Monte in his household, fine, but not around the streets of Rome, and certainly not threatening people with it. But once again, I suppose Caravaggio's become this cult figure, and everyone looks at him slightly in isolation. And I can assure you, he was not alone in doing this. You know, many artists at the time were, were caught and arrested on the same things, really. But there are these famous episodes. Um, in 1603, um, Caravaggio was involved in a very um, uh, sort of vicious libel trial. Um, his contemporary and rival, Giovanni Baglione, accused Caravaggio and others of writing some very scurrilous verses about him and sort of posting them all around Rome. Um, and there's this, this trial is actually beautifully documented and it's the only time um, we hear Caravaggio's own words, if you like, from his own mouth because he's in the witness box, as it were, uh, and it's written down what he, what he thinks about art, what, whether he, what, who he befriends, who he knows in Rome. And it's a really useful piece of information, but it is one of the very few bits of uh, information we have about him. Uh, in 1604, there's the famous episode where he's at the Taverna del Moro and the waiter brings him a plate of artichokes. Uh, four of them are cooked in oil, four of them are cooked in butter. And when Caravaggio receives the plate, he asks the waiter, which are butter and which are oil? And the waiter says, why don't you smell them and find out? And what does he do? He th picks up a plate, throws the plate at the waiter, cuts him, uh, and then threatens him with his sword. And the waiter just runs straight to the police. Uh, and his testimony, is, it's, it's interesting because you get a view, if you like, of Caravaggio. But again, he's not alone in this. It's a very violent place, Rome, in 1600, 1610. Um, and artists were not the only ones, you know, getting up to these sorts of tricks. Um, 1605, his landlady sues him because, in fact, Caravaggio had wounded a notary and then had escaped from Rome. He'd run to Genoa for a few months. He came back to find he couldn't get into the house he'd rented. Um, and his landlady said, well, I've seized all your possessions because you, you hadn't paid me rent for six months. You've also damaged my ceiling. Um, and, you know, I'm not letting you in. So he starts throwing stones at her window. And we know this again because, you know, there's a trial and her testimony. Um, and so we know he's in quite a lot of trouble. At this point, he's not resident in uh, a wealthy patron's home either. Um, but you can feel that, you know, he, he, we know one of the biographers, in fact, says, well, he paints for a bit, for a couple of weeks, and then he wanders about Rome, strides about Rome with a sword on his hip for a month or two. So he obviously had sort of surges of productivity and then really ed ended up getting into trouble. Um, and you feel slightly that it's slightly spiralling out of control. And, of course, it's all um, heading towards the famous incident in 1606. 
where he gets into a scuffle with Ranuccio Tomassoni and uh, wounds him fatally. Um, and following this murder, he runs from Rome. Uh, and then he's really on the run, I mean, pretty much for the last four years of his life. He first goes to Naples for a few months and then makes his way to Malta, uh, where he's actually made a knight of the Order of St. John, you know, a, 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 great, a great thing to, to, to be granted, if you like. Paints some wonderful pictures there, including the famous beheading of St. John the Baptist in Malta, sort of in exchange, if you like, for the knighthood. Um, but also gets into trouble there, gets in imprisoned, manages to escape from prison, clearly someone helping him on the inside, makes his way to Sicily, moves around Sicily and makes his way back to Naples, and all this because he, he really wants to get back to Rome, and he's waiting for the papal pardon after the murder of Tomassoni. Um, you feel, in a way, um, you, you, you feel in a way through his art as well that there is a sort of, um, he, he's running. You know, his, his art definitely changes key. And once again, we're very lucky here to have an example of his late works, the Salome uh, being presented with the head of John the Baptist. And you can see how different that picture is from everything else, you know, that I've spoken about so far. Um, it's paring it down to its bare essentials. It's, the, the, the palette is much more muted. The brushwork, you know, it's, it's really moved away from the very descriptive approach in these early works, particularly in the Supper of Timaeus, this beautifully refined brushwork. Here, the handling is much broader. It's much more expressionistic, if you like. And there's a real emphasis on the kind of rhetoric, on gesture and expression. Um, also, this kind of zooming in on a scene, I think, you know, makes it all the more powerful. This is Salome, who Herod has said, you know, what is your wish? I'll grant you anything. And she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. So he's beheaded. And here you have the brutal executioner thrusting forward, rather like this man thrusts his arm out. He thrusts the head forward and he's dropping it into the solver, into the platter. Uh, and the Baptist's mouth is still open, you know, whether he's sort of emitting a scream or it's his last breath. It's a very moving thing, and that's right in the front of the picture. You know, here you have a beautiful basket of fruit. There you have this, this decapitated head right in front. Um, and I find it a very moving picture, partly through the way he's applied the paint. You know, as I said, it's very broadly painted. Um, you can feel there's more kind of expression in the way he actually lays the paint on the canvas. Um, and, you know, there's no sense of background at all. I mean, here, of course, you have a sort of sense they're in a kind of neutral place, there's a wall with a light behind and so on, but here they're really in darkness. Um, and I think it's all the more effective for it, much more theatrical. And so the brutality of the executioner thrusting this head forward is, is an interesting counterpoint to the really quiet um, figure of the old maid. You know, she's so sorrowful, she's so um, introspective, that head in shadow sort of looking down. And these are types you know, by this point, I, you know, it's generally believed that he wasn't using live models in the way that he was earlier on, positioning models. These types reappear um, in other pictures at this date. And, um, I mean, although, of course, they must be inspired by people around him, I don't think he positioned them in the same way that he would have done in this very orchestrated way in the earlier pictures. I find very moving this juxtaposition of the youthful and beautiful Salome with the old maid, you know, sort of looking in two different directions. I mean, it's a picture that at first glance looks so simple, but there's great complexity here, I think, and you can read it in so many ways. And I find Salome, of, overall, is, is so enigmatic. I mean, she demanded to have the head of John the Baptist, and what is she feeling here? She's looking away, and, you know, is it disgust? You know, the sort of bloody, bloody head. I mean, she's holding the platter th with her, her sort of white cloth, almost like she can't bear to hold it, you know, with her bare hands but there's a sort of melancholic expression. So, I mean, I read sort of regret almost there and shame at having requested such a thing. Um, but, you know, these three heads, in a way, are sort of heads of expression, which sort of brings us back right to the beginning. You know, this is what Caravaggio was so good at doing uh, uh, and communicating expressions through his figures, through light. Uh, and here, the, the palette is so subdued. I mean, you know, you have color in these pictures, but this really is very limited. It's, it's a black and white picture, more or less. Um, this picture was probably painted in Naples, as I said, the second stay in Naples while he was on the run, um, while he was trying to make his way back to Rome. Now, it, it seems that he heard that a papal pardon had been released, so he, he boarded a boat in Naples on its way to Rome with paintings to present to Scipione Borghese, the papal nephew. Um, and the boat stopped at Porto Ercole, where he was um, arrested, 
and in fact there was a misunderstanding. He was thought to be someone else. Uh, and when he was finally released, the boat had disappeared, his pictures had disappeared, and desperate, he started set out on foot to make his way back to Rome. And he caught a fever, and there he died. Very solitary death, a very lonely death, and he was 39. And it's interesting to remember that because for an artist of such fame, you think of people in, in a similar sort of league, you know, Titian, Rubens, Rembrandt, I mean, the, you know, particularly Titian and Rembrandt, you know, they painted well into old age and they had incredibly vast active workshops with churning out pupils. I mean, Caravaggio was essentially quite a, a sort of solitary figure. He had no workshop in the traditional sense to speak of. I mean, he must have had students and one or two have been identified you know, helping him prepare pigments, particularly once he'd reached fame and success. But he had no traditional workshop, you know, of a master sort of teaching his pupils um, the rudiments of, of drawing and painting and so on. And he moved around a lot, but he essentially stayed within Italy and Malta. You know, Titian, Rubens, you know, they moved across various courts in Europe. And it's interesting because, you know, the geographical sort of confinement of Caravaggio, of course, didn't stop his fame spreading because, of course, Rome was this magnet for artists at that time. Um, but, you know, one has to remember, he, he, you know, in terms of documented activity, we only have about 18 years of a kind of career that we know of. Um, and it's incredible that he had such a lasting impact on artists at the time. Um, artists, as I said before, came to Rome as part of their training, if you like. They came to look at antiquity, they came to look at contemporary art. And of course, artists from all over Europe, there were an enormous number of Dutch, Flemish and French artists in Rome in the period of Caravaggio's lifetime, but also in the decades immediately following. And this, of course, helped spread his fame well beyond uh, Rome itself. These artists came to Rome, spent a few years uh, studying the art there, working there. Honthorst, Tebruggen, Baburen. I mean, some of these even stayed in the palazzi of Caravaggio's own patrons. Uh, and then they went back to Utrecht or to Flanders or wherever they came from, and they, they would carry back um, you know, Caravaggio's style and also interpret it in their own way. And so his style really got propagated across Europe in very many different ways. Of course, every artist took something different from Caravaggio. Um, the northern artists were particularly struck by his use of nature and of live models. Um, that's more in line with their own tradition of painting. I mean, the use of light, of course, was, was, you know, had a huge impact on art uh, in the 17th century. Um, but of course, that changes. Um, you know, one thinks of Caravaggio as having invented the candlelight scene. He never painted a single candle. Um, you know, it's extraordinary because we all think that. But of course, these candlelit scenes um, that one associates with him, of course, derive from his very singular use of light. Um, but they're sort of taken to a whole new level. And of course, Georges de Latour takes it really to a, a, a sort of great level of sophistication and theatricality. But he probably never even went to Italy. He never saw a Caravaggio. Um, so there are sort of, you know, misconceptions a bit um, about uh, Caravaggio's influence on artists in his own day. But also his, his influence had a sort of ripple effect across Europe, I think became diluted because, of course, an artist would go to Rome and then would absorb things from Caravaggio, go back to where he'd come from and in a way sort of amalgamate that into their own style. And this is something I'm particularly interested in. And this autumn, we're going to be having an exhibition here that opens in October called Beyond Caravaggio. And that's going to be looking at not Caravaggio in isolation, but very much at the impact that he had on art uh, across Europe, really in those sort of first 30, 40 years of the 17th century. Caravaggio dies, as I said, he dies in 1610, he's 39, and yet he has this enormous impact on art immediately. And in fact, in a way, it, it really um, sort of balloons after his death. You know, you can see that collectors are desperately scrabbling, trying to buy pictures by him, um, and pictures by his followers, commissioning pictures by his followers. And more and more of these works are being produced just for the open market. There's clearly a huge demand for them. Uh, but it's all over. By the middle of the century, by about 1630 in Rome, and by the middle of the 17th century across Europe, um, it, Caravaggio and Caravagism, which is how this sort of artistic phenomenon has been called Caravagism, is really out of favor. And you know, Caravaggio really falls into oblivion. I don't think people really know that. <clears throat> You know, now he's such a famous figure, but he was only really rediscovered in the early 20th century. You know, it's relatively recent times, culminating in a really important exhibition in Milan in 1951, which presented for the first time all known works by Caravaggio and the Caravaggisti by his followers. 
Um, and it's only really in the last sort of 60, 70 years, if you like, that an enormous amount of interest um, has been applied to Caravaggio and, of course, now to those of artists known in his circle. But I hope that through these three pictures, I've been able to tell you a little bit about Caravaggio's life. But also, I think here in the National Gallery, you can see just how his style develops over time. These three pictures are so different. And in a way, reading them uh, alongside the, the sort of the biographical details of the artist's life are really key. You know, from these sort of uh, the importance of nature and expression in the early works to the great sophistication of his mature works. And you can see in a picture like this just how um, you know, original he must have seemed to his contemporaries. And then the late pictures, which of course were the subject of an exhibition here, um, you know, a few years ago, Caravaggio, The Final Years. They're sort of on a different emotional key, I think. Thank you very much.